Well, today we are going to talk about what it's like to make that decision between choosing a midwife group or an obstetrician group to do your prenatal care and delivery. So today I feel really lucky because I'm joined by my friend Lena Wood. <laughs> uh, Lena has a really wide background in early childhood education as well as being a birth doula before she became a midwife. So I just want to start by saying, you know, um, welcome. And how did you end up switching into this career of becoming a midwife yeah. when you already had these other <laughs> careers? Thanks so much for having me. It's really fun my journey. I feel like I've always been really passionate about supporting families and um, education was a big part of that. So I'm trained as a Montessori elementary teacher. Oh, um, cool. and and got that credential in 2009 but I always knew that classroom teaching wasn't gonna be my like ultimate forever job and a good friend of mine was it beginning her journey um, or their journey to becoming a certified professional midwife mm -hmm. um, and they said you know Lena you would make a really great doula mm -hmm. and I was like I like I'm young, I've never been to a birth before. It always sounded really, really cool. I um, did my birth doula training here at Birthing Way College of Midwifery, um, mm. and I was just drawn into the energy of it, the power of it, the, mm. like, the way it straddles both the very mundane, like birth is very ordinary and yet sacred mm. at the same time. Like mm. I wanted to like touch both of those things. You know, about, Two to three years after becoming a doula, I sat down with my husband and I was mm -hmm. like, so remember how I said I was never going to be a midwife? <laughs> well, I think I've changed my mind. In 12 or so, I started pre-nursing um, classes at PCC mm -hmm. and then did my both my nursing degree and my master's in midwifery at OHSU. and. I've been in practice since 2016. Congratulations. Yeah. You mentioned getting your master's. Can you talk about like what is the training and background for mm -hmm. midwives? And you said there's different kinds of midwives. Yeah. So in the U.S., there are two um, general categories of midwives. One is the certified nurse midwife, which is the route that I took. Um, certified nurse midwives have an undergraduate degree in nursing, so a bachelor of nursing. And immediately after graduate, Graduating um, with my um, BSN, I sat for my um, nursing boards, the NCLEX exam. Mm -hmm. That was in September, um, and at the end of September, the master's program started. Mm -hmm. um, so that's considered an advanced practice nursing specialty, a master's of nursing degree, mm -hmm. um, two years, but it's focused on midwifery care, the elements of midwifery care. The last uh, semester, quarter, whatever, however your program is divided up, is essentially a mini residency. Um, we call it integration. And during mm -hmm. those eight to 10 weeks, you are paired with a midwife or a couple of midwives in practice. Mm -hmm. And you essentially are kind of running the show. Yeah, how does yeah. that contrast with the other type of midwife that you mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm the certified professional midwife? Yeah, so CPMs, um, they're certified through a different body. There's a couple of key distinctions. One is that they are not necessarily trained as nurses. That undergraduate mm -hmm. degree in nursing is not a requirement. But really, I mean, midwifery, if you think about it, it's one of the oldest professions in the world. Mm -hmm. Women have been having babies forever. Mm -hmm. So there had to be someone yeah. trained and skilled and they didn't go to nursing school. Um, so certified professional midwives complete some kind of accredited program, um, but it's outside of the traditional model of nursing school. And some might also do a combination of, of self-study and apprenticeship, a more mm -hmm. traditional model, historically speaking, mm -hmm. um, where they work with one or two or three different midwives over the course of their clinical training. And when they feel ready um, and they, you know, Mm -hmm. certain clinical milestones, you know, I've attended a certain number of prenatals and a certain number of normal deliveries and a certain mm -hmm. number of postpartum visits, etc. then they are qualified to sit for their exam, uh, which is administered by a different body. Mm -hmm. um, CPMs are generally practicing as home birth midwives mm -hmm. or in independent birth centers. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any states where CPMs are allowed hospital privileges okay. at this time. 
Although I certainly think that that would be within their scope if they wanted it to be. I have yeah. a question about that. Just yeah. coming from like a more traditional Western um, background is mm -hmm. that I have read some articles that cited higher mortality rates mm -hmm. for home birth. Um, I was curious, um, have a friend who is a CPM and then mm -hmm. you're also a nurse mm -hmm. midwife. Where where do you stand on that? Do you feel like there is higher risk to home birth? And are there certain people that should do home birth and certain people who should steer away from mm -hmm. home birth? Yeah, that's a really great question and a very complex one. I think mm -hmm. it depends on a lot of different factors. So for me, when I'm counseling patients or potential patients who are like on the fence, about, you know, which is the best setting for me. I'm really leaning towards a home birth, but I don't know. There's a couple of big things that come up. One is just simply the level of training and experience of your midwife. What are their safety numbers? They should be able to talk about their cesarean rate and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, their complication rate, mm -hmm. how they handle different situations. Mm -hmm. um, the other big piece um, that comes to mind first and foremost is what are that patient's or client's individual risk factors. Uh -huh. um, so those can include things like age, um, previous history of cesarean section or not, previous history of hemorrhage or not, whether they're coming in with um, pre-existing underlying conditions like type 1 diabetes or essential mm. hypertension. Um, all of those things um, play into whether an individual is going to be a, um, a healthy and safe candidate for home birth. Mm -hmm. But there's counseling that would go around someone having had a previous cesarean, for example. Mm -hmm. The risk there being that the um, at the site of the previous uterine incision, there's an increased risk for rupture. Mm -hmm. um, and outside of a hospital setting that could be fatal um, mm -hmm. without immediate care. You would work with your midwife and ideally your midwife would be honest with you. You know, if you were working with the CPM and you had one or two of these different things, mm -hmm. if they're a good midwife, they're going to say, you know, I don't feel that, you know, you're an appropriate candidate mm -hmm. given your risks. Mm -hmm. If someone were relatively healthy and didn't have those red flags mm -hmm. and they started to proceed with a home birth, but then for whatever reason, like maybe there was some decelerations where the baby's mm -hmm. heart rate went down or some, some kind of signs that it wasn't going well. Um, so the home birth midwife would not be able to do a C-section, right? Then would That's they correct. Have to transfer you to a hospital mm -hmm. at that point. Yep, and that leads me right to the other big consideration that I ask people to think about mm -hmm. is if you do need to transfer, what is the experience that that midwife has with the transfer process? What relationships have they cultivated with the local hospitals? Mm -hmm. uh, there are some places where midwives are so persecuted that mm -hmm. they literally drop their patients off and leave mm -hmm. because they are worried about their physical safety and being mm -hmm. charged with um, malpractice and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In the best scenario, you have a midwife who has developed really good relationships with their local hospitals. Um, and I think that um, Legacy Emanuel is a hospital that's done a really good job of this. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are instances um, certain levels of blood pressure, um, et cetera, where you would transfer a patient or like mm -hmm. if they weren't making progress and you were worried about malposition. And the midwife here in Portland, I feel like it's a pretty open space. So your midwife would stay with you. They just mm -hmm. wouldn't be in charge of your care anymore. They would mm -hmm. step into more of a doula or support role. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about birth centers. Mm -hmm. Is that like kind of like in between a hospital and a home birth? Yeah, I think it gets billed that way. Uh, quite often. So birth centers, some are run by CPMs um, and some are run by CNMs. Um, the birth centers that are run by CPMs, it's essentially like having a home birth, but you're in a setting where someone else is taking care of all of this stuff, right? Uh -huh. Like it's not in your house. You don't have to clean up afterwards, but it still has that very home-like nurturing environment. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like a clinic. Uh, 
There is a birth center here in Portland that is mostly staffed by certified nurse midwives. And one of the advantages that that birth center has is that the certified nurse midwives are privileged to both attend the birth center births, but they also have hospital privileges. Oh, that's cool. What's that one called? Um, it's the Women's Healthcare Associates Birth Center um, at their Gateway location. And are they connected with a hospital? Mm -hmm. So all of their midwives who practice there have privileges, admitting privileges at um, Adventist Hospital. Okay. And so if they need to transfer, it's a built-in process. They transfer to Adventist. The nurse midwife who's been managing them mm -hmm. suddenly, you know, becomes their, you know, attending provider. They oh, admit cool. them to the hospital. And, you know, for people who are transferring for things like pain management, like they're really mm -hmm. tired and they want an epidural, mm -hmm. or they need a little bit of Pitocin to kind of keep those contractions mm -hmm. going, um, but otherwise mom and baby are safe, mm -hmm. then the midwife would still attend. They would get that seamless transition. Mm -hmm. If they're transferring because they need a cesarean section or some other urgent intervention, then of mm -hmm. course they're gonna hand off to an obstetrician. Okay. And I think ultimately that's the biggest difference is that as midwives, our training is grounded in low-risk, healthy, physiologically normal birth, mm -hmm. which is 80 to 90 percent of mm -hmm. all births. Mm -hmm. And obstetricians are trained not only in that, but also in more high-risk and complicated cases. Mm -hmm. um, and they're trained in, as surgeons, so they can mm -hmm. do C-sections, mm -hmm. which midwives are not trained as surgeons. Mm -hmm. We can um, receive extra training to become uh, first assists, mm -hmm. um, and like I have that training. So if one mm -hmm. of my patients um, suddenly needs a C-section, I don't have to just abandon her mm -hmm. to a stranger she's never met before. I scrub in, and I'm assisting so the surgeon, which is really yeah. awesome. Um, so one question I've gotten from some of my friends is like, if something did come up, like mm -hmm. how quickly is that transfer process? Like, is it like minutes to hours or like, depends where you are. And that's, a, I think a big deciding factor for people. If you live rurally and you want a home birth, but your nearest, you know, high level hospital is an mm -hmm. hour drive away. You have to think really hard mm -hmm. about whether you're comfortable with that risk. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here in Portland, you're not very far from mm -hmm. a hospital and an operating room and mm -hmm. all of the things you would need mm -hmm. to do an urgent C-section if needed. Um, would people go in an ambulance or in their own transport? It depends what the scenario is. Okay. I mean, if the midwife were concerned about a postpartum hemorrhage, she's probably going to call the ambulance because they Time have... Is really essential. Yeah, and they have um, resuscitation capabilities that you don't have in a car. Um, if it's sure. someone just really wants an epidural, she's probably going to go in her own car because yeah. that's not medically urgent. But right. yeah, bleeding issues, high blood pressure issues where you're worried about potential risk for seizures like mm -hmm. preeclampsia, um, decreased fetal heart rate, all of those mm -hmm. things are probably going to buy you an ambulance ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what would you say to somebody who um, is pretty early in their stage of pregnancy and they're still trying to decide mm -hmm. if they want to work with an obstetrician group or um, mm -hmm. a midwife group? How mm -hmm. would they um, navigate making that decision mm -hmm. for each individual? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's pretty easy to kind of narrow down between OBs and um, community birth, like home birth or a birth center birth like the people who want a home birth they generally tend to know mm -hmm. i think the harder one is between a certified nurse midwife and an ob because we practice in the same setting but some of the things you can ask um, are like how much time do you have with a prenatal for each type of provider what kind of on-call support do you have um, how much time do you get to spend with your patients during labor? Are you like just popping in at the very end for the delivery? Mm -hmm. Or are you able to be there more mm -hmm. um, during the labor process and provide more emotional support as well? Um, what does your postpartum care look like? Do I only get to see you at six weeks postpartum or do you do more regular check-ins? Mm -hmm. um, I and, think those are things that are really hard for women to like come down and ask about because mm -hmm. we don't it's very hard for people to kind of advocate for like this yep. is the support that I need but it mm -hmm. sounds like it's a really good idea to really kind of lay it out and yeah. see. well and you have to kind of do some introspection and think about what kind of care do you want like mm -hmm. You may feel most comfortable in a setting that's familiar to you, not just physically, but culturally. And what we're familiar with, most of us in the U.S., is a hospital 
with a doctor who's trained as a surgeon because that's all that we've grown up seeing. <laughs> and so if you know mentally, like, I'm only going to be able to relax and really trust this process if I know I have a surgeon at hand at any moment, mm -hmm. you might be a really good fit with an OB practice. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's not to mm -hmm. say that your birth experience is going to be less than or mm -hmm. um, subpar or whatever. I know many physicians who are wonderful, wonderful OBs and care very deeply about their patients. Mm -hmm. I will say as a midwife, what drew me to my practice and what I see patients being drawn to is, um, like I said, that overall orientation of birth is normal mm -hmm. and it's part of a whole reproductive mm -hmm. lifespan. Um, Patient-centered care, meaning we do share decision-making and that means I may have someone who declines to do a two hour glucose tolerance test, a screening for gestational mm -hmm. diabetes. Um, a lot of OBs would basically kind of harp on that patient and insist and say, you must do it. It's, it's medically necessary. Your baby could die. You could, you know, kind of go like that big guns route of like, <laughs> do this or else. And so where I see my role is it's not to convince someone to do something or not to do something. It's to give all of the information evidence-based that we have about whatever the intervention is mm -hmm. to help them unpack their own values around that decision-making process mm -hmm. and to help support them in whatever decision they make. And if they decide, no, I'm not going to do screening for gestational diabetes, I'm going to tell them what the risks of untreated diabetes are, mm -hmm. and I'm going to provide support on, like, here are the things you can do to maximize the health for your baby. What about, um, like, some quantifiable data? Is there any evidence to show that birth with midwives is, you know, um, like you get better outcomes or mm -hmm. less C-section rates? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So midwives have been shown, nurse midwives um, in particular, have been shown to have outcomes that are as safe as, if not safer than, obstetricians. Um, CNM patients are less likely to need um, cesarean sections, um, and particularly those CNM births where they're also attended by um, and supported with doulas um, also mm -hmm. tend to need less intervention, less Pitocin, less C-sections, less yeah. um, assisted delivery like a vacuum or a forceps, um, definitely less episiotomies all around. Mm. You know, the evidence is complex. It is true that by nature we're caring for healthier, low risk patients. So and there so, is a certain selection so, bias. Yeah, so, yeah naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but even when you try to do your best to account for that statistically, mm -hmm. um, midwife patients tend to have better outcomes and they tend to be more satisfied with mm. their whole prenatal care mm -hmm. and birth experience. That's really empowering to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, I feel I worry that women in this country and some other countries with high mm -hmm. C-section rates is that, you know, we don't feel empowered mm -hmm. and that doesn't feel like a shared decision. It's like you're told that you need this or you yeah. need that. Yeah, I think um, it might not necessarily occur to a lot of OBs to have a preemptive conversation about cesarean during their prenatals. Like, mm -hmm. here are some scenarios what that might come up during your birth where I would come in and talk to you about my recommendation to have a C-section. Here's what that process would look like. Here's the kinds of things I would talk about. In different scenarios, this is how much time we would have to make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, those are all conversations I have with my patients so that they don't go in blind. They know that, okay, if labor is just taking a really, really, really long time and we're not seeing any cervical change, that is eventually reason to consider a C-section, but that's mm -hmm. not going to be an emergency conversation. Mm -hmm. If a nurse comes running in because your baby's heartbeat is really, really low and it's not coming back up, that is going to be an emergent cesarean and there's not going to be as much time to debate the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But let's have that conversation a little bit preemptively now, like mm -hmm. why we would make that recommendation and based on what data, mm -hmm. um, so that if that were to arise, you wouldn't feel like you were blown over by a truck. Yeah. And then after birth, is there any difference in postnatal care? Mm -hmm. Women do better when they see their providers more often and earlier than they currently are. So the standard now, or what it has been for years, is that if you're an OB patient, mm -hmm. you're a first-time mom, um, you get a two-week postpartum visit 
just to like check in and make sure everything's cool. And then you have a six week postpartum follow up. Maybe they do an exam. If you need a pap smear at that time, they do that. And many midwifery practices follow that model. Um, and it's not necessarily because they think that women should only be seen at two and six weeks postpartum, but because of the way um, Medicaid reimbursement works mm -hmm. um, and how prenatal care and postpartum care is billed for. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of a global package. And so providers don't get any more money for seeing women more often or sooner, um, which oh, wow, I didn't know that. is evidence-based care. And in the home birth setting, mm -hmm. you get your midwife staying with you for several hours after your delivery. They come back within 24 hours, 48 hours, wow. one week, two weeks, and six weeks. So that's a lot more one-on-one -on -one on attention. Average, a lot more. Mm -hmm. And they, um, because they're not generally referring out, they're providing hands-on breastfeeding support. They're, mm. um, they're trained to manage newborn care for the first six weeks. And so they're mm. doing, in conjunction with the family's pediatrician, they're doing newborn assessments mm. and making sure the baby's growing well and gaining enough weight and all of that. Are home birth midwives covered by insurance then since they do all these extra mm -hmm. visits? Some are and some aren't. Ultimately, you want to be working with a practice where you feel safe and supported and validated, not just as a pregnant vessel, but a holistic person. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank awesome. you. You're welcome. Well, I'm really excited because Lena is also a mindfulness teacher and uh, will be helping us to lead some monthly um, support sessions mm -hmm. for new parents. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you teach mindfulness or your approach to it? Yeah, absolutely. So I am um, finishing up my training process with um, a group called Mindfulness-Based Childbirth and Parenting. That's the name of the curriculum, um, MBCP. It was developed by a nurse midwife named Nancy Bardacki at UCSF. Um, and she based her curriculum off of the MBSR, or Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Model, mm -hmm. which was developed by John Kabat-Zinn. The way my courses are structured are that they are um, about eight weeks long. We meet weekly. Um, it involves participation in different mindfulness practices, learning different skills, different ways of meditating, um, combined with all of the comprehensive information you would need to know or that you would get in a childbirth ed class. Mm. So we cover the physiology of birth and mechanisms of birth. We cover mm -hmm. pain management options and we pair that with the mindfulness practices that we've been oh, learning cool. as a way to think about pain and, um, recalibrate our relationship with pain and stress and fear. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about newborn feeding um, and newborn sleep-wake cycles, early emotional development, mm -hmm. so what to look for in your baby, um, what their typical um, cues are going to be, and how mm -hmm. you can you know, establish that early bonding even in the face of potentially stressful birth mm -hmm. stories. Um, so it's, I really love the curriculum. I think mm -hmm. it's what, if I had all the time in the world, mm -hmm. um, with my patients, it's what I would give every patient. Mm -hmm. Um, but even as a nurse midwife, I don't have that time to give for prenatal, um, childbirth education. Mm -hmm. And so this course, um, which, you know, happens outside of the clinical context is a way to, to offer that to the community. Mm -hmm. but I'll be starting another class at the end of June. Mm -hmm. It's open to anyone and, um, we're doing it on zoom. So it's accessible. You don't even necessarily need to be in Oregon. Okay. Um, but yeah, we meet for two hours weekly. Um, there's a, a day long, um, day of practice between weeks six and seven, where we do some more focused practice. Yeah. What is your course called and how, how do people find you? Yeah. So the course, it's kind of a mouthful. It's called Mindfulness Based Childbirth and Parenting or MBCP. Um, my business that I'm running it under is called Mindful Birth PDX. And you can find us on the web at mindfulbirthpdx.com. Yeah. That's really cool. I like that it incorporates the traditional sort of birthing classes. Because mm -hmm. when you initially told me about the idea, I was like, well, I'm so busy. I don't have time to do a normal birth class and right. a mindfulness class. That's yes. just going to make me feel guilty for not being mindful. Right. No, this, is, this is everything all yeah. packaged together. That's perfect. Yeah.